Hey folks, Winston for Carbide3D here. We are in the business of making CNC's and CNC accessories, and this type of production has almost always invariably required the use of industrial manufacturing capabilities. But there are some cases where a big machine isn't always the right machine. Take this Delrin insert for example, which is used as a light diffuser in Bit0 2.0. If we wanted tens of thousands of these pieces, a part like this would be a fantastic candidate for injection molding. But we were looking for volumes in the high hundreds to low thousands range, and we had an extremely tight deadline. It wouldn't have been cost effective nor time effective to commission a mold to make these pieces. We needed these diffusers ready as soon as possible so we could build bit zeros to ship with Nomad 3s at launch or shortly thereafter. This job was in a super awkward middle ground in terms of production scale. We could definitely have machined one of these diffusers ourselves because it isn't a particularly difficult part to make, but it also isn't a part you would want to hold on a vise on a VMC. Making them in volume like this would be hyper tedious. This also isn't a part you could use vacuum work holding on because it's so small. But there is a third option for work holding, which is adhesive work holding. And this would be a perfect use for our own super hold kit. As for what machine we should run these parts on, let's take a look at the requirements derived from what this part is. These diffusers are small, which means you need small cutters to define all the details, like the corners in the carbide logo. Small diameter cutters thrive with a high speed spindle, since tiny cutters work best taking tiny bites of material with every revolution. A 16th inch end mill loaded in a Shapeoko screaming along at 30,000 RPM, or a Nomad 3 at 24,000 RPM, can actually be more efficient than, say, a Haas running at 12 or 15,000 RPM. The limiting factor is the cutter itself, not necessarily the raw power or weight class of a CNC. But we also wanted maximum precision and repeatability. We manufacture our Bit0 probe bodies in house, which means we have full control over the tolerance and precision of all the features. The tool pathing for the diffuser pocket will never change, so we have a constant fixed size target to hit if we want the Delrin pieces to snap in perfectly. The Nomad 3 has a big advantage over the Shapeoko in the precision department with a lead screw system that has a theoretical resolution that is five times better. We would be able to work out with just a little trial and error what our diffuser tolerances should be in order to achieve an easy but seamless press fit. This decision was the best case scenario for us because it kept our vertical machining centers free to churn out Nomad and Shapeoko components, and anyone in the shop could be taught to safely operate the Nomad between their other tasks. Once we had dialed in the perfect zero height for the program so that we could just barely cut through the Delrin and not into the masking tape, it was just a matter of loading material in the correct spot, hitting run, swapping in a new tool after 60 minutes, continuing the program, removing finished parts, and repeating. By pulling a person off the Nomad assembly line for a few minutes at a time, we could churn out hundreds of diffusers a day and meet our quota within a week or two. We tested a sample from each run in a test probe body to confirm that the Nomad was still cutting just as accurately as it was on the first batch as the last batch. And in case you're wondering about the cam behind this part, we started out with a 282 end mill to rough out the majority of the part, finish the top face, and profile out around the perimeter to within about 0.1 millimeters of the bottom of the stock. And then we swapped in a 132nd inch end mill to do some rest machining and clean out the little corners in these C's, as well as do the final cutout around the profile of this part. There are of course ways to improve the efficiency of this process. For example, if we designed this insert to have features with a minimum bend radius larger than a 32nd of an inch, we could skip the tool change and just run a 16th inch end mill for everything. But personally, I didn't want to compromise on the precision of the logo and make the carbide C look a little more sloppy. If we had opted to source 8x8 inch sheets of Delrin instead of raiding our own inventory of 4x5 inch pieces that we sell, we could have extended our interval between machine tending visits, but I was admittedly in a bit of a rush to optimize a process based on material we already had on hand. We could have also used wider strips of masking tape to make loading and removing parts a little bit easier, but again, we did the best with what we had on hand. There are lots of little changes and choices that would have improved the efficiency of this process, but at the end of the day, we produced the parts we needed using the resources at our disposal. The Nomad 3 did its job flawlessly and to a level of precision we would not have been able to achieve with an outside vendor. I was able to refine my toolpaths within an hour or so of testing and iteration and get these Delrin diffusers to fit absolutely perfectly. For those of you that have a V2 Bit0, there's a very good chance it has a diffuser in it made by this particular Nomad 3 R&D prototype number 2 using our own tooling and materials. 
I hope you found this look behind the scenes interesting. There are a lot of small to intermediate scale production applications for a compact desktop milling machine, and we hope we've opened your eyes to some of the possibilities. Until next time, good luck and have fun machining, folks.